Hey guys, Matt here today getting back into John chapter 10 and Lord willing we'll finish John 10 today. Uh, last time we talked about what I would say is the heart of John 10. It's John 10, 27, 28, 29. Uh, let's just take a quick look at it. Jesus says to the, to the Jews, you do not believe in me because you're not part of my flock. Then he goes on and he says, my sheep, which you're not part of, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them. Now, the knowing there is an intimate thing. It's not just Jesus knows them, because technically, doesn't he know everybody? He does. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. They listen to me. They love me. They follow me, and I give them eternal life, and no one can tear them from my grasp. He goes on, he says, my father holds them in his grasp. No one can tear them from my father's grasp either. And by the way, my father and I are one. So what is the, the ultimate epitome of the good shepherd? He never loses a sheep. That's the big idea, right? So you see, God does the choosing. God does the saving. God does the keeping because he's the only one who can. He does it through Christ. He, actually, the whole trinity is at work there. No one comes to the Son lest the Father draws him in. The Holy Spirit convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and Jesus opens their eyes, right? And that's what the Good Shepherd does. The Good Shepherd keeps his sheep. He, uh, you could say his reputation is on the line. If people say, well, uh, you can lose your salvation. I walked away from Jesus. Uh, I used to be a Christian. No, you never, you never really did because, you see, he's a Good Shepherd, he doesn't. He might let people wander a little bit, only to chastise them. But he never lets anybody away, fall away for good, because his reputation would be soiled. And he's perfect. So we move on from there to verse 31. What do you suppose the Jews are going to do? Well, verse 31, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Yeah, that's what they always do, right? Uh, one commentator said it best, I think, when he said, "In the Synoptics, Jesus isn't on trial till the end." And John, ever since John 5 through here, John 10, Jesus is on the trial, on trial rather, all the time. They're constantly putting him on trial. So Jesus does a sign or wonder, which is really the Father doing it through him. And a few people believe, but most people hate him. And they say things like, do another one. Do another trick. So, verse 31, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered, I have shown you many good works from the Father. I mean, tying it into God, right? Tying it into the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? Which one? I'm curious, Jesus is saying. Which one are you going to stone me for? Is it, is it raising the paralyzed man? Is it giving sight to the blind man? Is it, is it feeding the 5,000? Is it feeding the 4,000? Which one is it? you, you got to tell me. And so the Jews answered him in verse 33, It's not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy. Because you, being a man, make yourself God. Blasphemy is the worst thing that anyone could do. It makes yourself God, makes yourself equal with God. But ironically, it's the Jews committing blasphemy and they're accusing it of Jesus. Well, of course, Jesus can't commit blasphemy because he's God, right? And then Jesus is going to do something striking, something remarkable. He's going to quote Psalm 82. And this could be, uh, if, if this were taken out of context, if a person were to uh, not know, or maybe eisegetically kind of lift this out of context, this next part could be confusing. So we're going to walk through it kind of slowly. Jesus answered them, verse 34, and he quotes Psalm 82, and he says, Is it not written in your law, so right away, Jesus is saying, oh, it's, oh yeah, you're the, you're the Pharisees, you're the Jews, and all the Old Testament's for you. Yes, you love Moses, oh sure. Isn't it written in your law? He kind of puts the ball in their court, doesn't he? He makes them invested in this argument. He says, well, okay, if I'm committing blasphemy, it's your law. You're the righteous one, so tell me. Is it not written in your law, I said you are all gods? I'm sorry, I said you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him who the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming, because I said I am the Son of God? So, Jesus 
says, isn't it written in your law? And if it's written in your law, I call you sons. He says, I said you are gods. So why would it be blasphemous if I, the consecrated one, the chosen one, the set apart one from God, call myself the son of God? He says, well, isn't, wouldn't it be blasphemous for you too? Or he's, he's trying to get them to think about this. And people could read this and say, what does he mean? What does it mean in Psalm 82 when he says, Son of God, or uh, 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 little gods, or aren't, aren't you gods? So when we think of this, we've got to remember context. Context. What's John 10 all about? Well, John 10 is all about Jesus being the Good Shepherd. Okay, why do we need a Good Shepherd? Well, as we saw in Ezekiel 34, all the other shepherds were bad. Remember Ezekiel, he said, isn't it enough that you feed yourself, but you gotta stomp over all the other food so the sheep starve? You knock over the sheep going after the food? Isn't it bad enough that you not only only drink for yourselves, but that you muddy the water so no one else can drink. They weren't just taking care of themselves. They were hoarding everything so none of the other sheep could be fed. Uh, primarily, uh, primarily spiritually, but also physically because they'd be dispersed for their sins. They were supposed to lead them to God and lead them to walking in obedience. But they didn't. They were bad shepherds. They needed the good one. So he's, he quotes Psalm 82, and let's take a look at Psalm 82. And here's what it says. God has taken his place in the divine council. So God has the divine council, of course. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. In the midst of the gods. Well, who are the gods? Well, Jesus says it's the people in the Old Testament who the word of God came to. It's the shepherds. It's the kings. It's the prophets. It's the priests. It's those that heard the word of God, but did nothing with it, who were supposed to be in charge. So he's using gods here, kind of tongue-in-cheek, little g. They were supposed to be God's chosen people. We'll make more sense of it at the end. But they never walked like it. So he, God takes his divine counsel, his perfect counsel, in the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. Well, why does he have to hold judgment against the small g gods? Because they're not doing what they're supposed to. They're supposed to be good shepherds. They're supposed to be watching out for the sheep, but they're not. So, right out of the chute, we see there's a problem with this small g God analogy. He's holding judgment over them. Verse 2, what's his judgment? What does he say? How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? How long will you judge unjustly? They were wicked. The judges were wicked. The shepherds were wicked, the kings were wicked overall, and they judged unjustly. They were impartial. The, the, they weren't judging rightly. They were showing partiality to the wicked. God hates that. So he says, how long are you going to keep doing this? Gods, little g, tongue in cheek. Verse 3, give justice to the weak and the fatherless, like a good shepherd. Right? Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute like a good king, like a good shepherd would. Rescue the weak and the needy like a good shepherd. Doesn't say that. I'm adding that, of course. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. Sounds like Hosea 4. Hosea 4, 6. My people perish for the lack of knowledge. And the knowledge here isn't math and, and reading, right? The knowledge is the knowledge of Yahweh. It's the knowledge of God. If they had the knowledge of God, they would be good shepherds. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. The leaders are walking in darkness. What does that mean? It means the blind are leading the blind. They're not good shepherds. They're not good leaders. They're not God's. Though they're supposed to be. And what does that term mean? He's going to say it next. So they need, they have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. And then God says, I said, you are gods, comma, sons of the Most High, all of you, 
Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any old prince. So, a couple of thoughts here. First of all, this is synonymous parallelism. This is poetry. Verset 1 is always built up in Verset 2 in synonymous poetry. Verset 2 always rounds out or fills in Verset 1. So Verset 1, 80, Psalm 82, 6 says, I said, you are gods, comma, Verset 2, sons of the Most High, all of you. What does it mean that they're little g gods? They're supposed to be sons of the Most High God. They're supposed to be faithfully following Yahweh. They're supposed to be faithfully leading the people of Israel, but they're not. So what's going to happen? Verse 7, Nevertheless, like ordinary men, you shall die and fall like any prince. See, God made a covenant with Israel. Israel never kept the covenant, but a very few remnant. And Israel was supposed to have faithful leaders and and, and shepherds and, and priests and kings and they were supposed to lead and protect and guide spiritually and physically but they weren't. They were poor. They were spiritually bankrupt. And so he says, okay, although you were gods, in fact sons of the Most High God, all of you, nevertheless, because your wickedness, I'm, I'm adding that, because your wickedness, like regular men you shall die and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. Why does God have to arise and judge? Because the little g gods aren't really doing what they're supposed to do. So he brings judgment on the earth, and he shall inherit all the nations. All the nations, all, including the Gentiles. That's the gospel. That's what the good shepherd does. That's what Jesus is doing here. So he calls the, the, the Jews out, and he says, Isn't it written in your law, you are, I said you are gods? And here I am, I'm the consecrated one, and so I can't call myself the Son of God? Jesus is putting them in their place spiritually. And so what's going to happen next? Well, verse 37, Jesus says, If I am not doing the works my, of my Father, then don't believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know knowledge of God and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Jesus is, is being graceful and being kind to them. He says, okay, if you're not going to believe me, at least won't you believe the works I'm doing? Can't you tell the Father is doing the works through me? Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. Verse 40, he went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first. And there he remained, and many came to him, and they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true. What's going to happen now? Well, surprise, surprise, and many believed in him there. So, we see John 10 ends, and it's all about Jesus as the Good Shepherd. It's all about Jesus doing what no one else could do, right? And so, Jesus calls his sheep by name. Jesus goes through the door. It's the ordination process. It's the suffering servant. It's the gospel. It's the perfect life, the virgin birth, the perfect life, uh, the sinless perfection of Christ, never failing, never falling, always fulfilling the law, and then dying on the cross and raising again. That's the door. And then he becomes the door. He's the door of the sheep. He's the good shepherd. He's the one who goes after every sheep and he says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and no one can tear them from my grasp. And of course, then they want to kill him, and Jesus says, I'm the Son of God. Wasn't it written about you? Aren't you all supposed to be little g-gods, but you're not. You're poor shepherds. You're selfish. You're spiritually bankrupt. And so Jesus leaves them, and, and actually a few of them at the end actually do believe, because they say, Look at John. This one is doing actually miracles, and John didn't do that. So the big idea of the whole chapter 10 is the Good Shepherd has come, and the Good Shepherd calls his sheep by name, holds his sheep, and gives them eternal life. They can never fall away, because if they did, he wouldn't be a Good Shepherd. Peace.